Welcome listeners to another chilling episode of Ava Horror Zone, where we unravel the spine-tingling stories shared by everyday people. I'm your host, Ava. The story you're about to hear tonight was sent to us by one of our listeners, Mike, a rideshare driver from Colorado. What started as a routine night for him quickly spiraled into a terrifying experience he'll never forget. Buckle up. This is the final fare. Mike leaned against his car, looking out at the vast, dark expanse of the Denver skyline. It was a cool October night, the kind he used to love. The crisp air, the quiet streets, the low hum of distant traffic, it had always brought him a sense of peace. But tonight was different. There was an eerie stillness in the air, something unsettling that he couldn't quite shake. He checked his phone again. Nothing. No new ride requests. It had been a slow night, slower than usual. The economy was in a slump, and people were staying in, avoiding unnecessary expenses. Mike sighed, rubbing his hands together to keep warm. He sipped on his now lukewarm coffee, hoping for a ride that would make the night worthwhile. As a former small-town guy, moving to Denver had been a dream come true for Mike. Back in his hometown of Crestone, life was simple, quiet, almost too quiet. He had grown up surrounded by mountains and forests, where the most excitement came from local festivals or weekend fishing trips. But Denver was different. It was alive, always bustling with people and opportunities. Mike had always been fascinated by the city lights and the promise of something bigger. His love for driving had started early. Long stretches of open road had always calmed him, and night driving in particular gave him a sense of serenity. There was something about the empty roads, the quiet, and the solitude that he enjoyed. But more than anything, driving at night had always been good for business. People needed rides after late night shifts, parties, or long trips, and Mike had made a good living off it, at least until recently. Just as he was about to call it a night, his phone buzzed. Finally, a ride request. Mike looked down at the screen. Paul S., pickup location, near Bear Creek, 20 miles. The location was far, further than he usually liked to go, but the fare looked promising. A long drive meant good money, and with the way his night had been going, he couldn't afford to be picky. He hit the accept button and grabbed his keys. As he started the engine, a call came through. It was Paul, the passenger who had just booked the ride. Mike answered, expecting the usual, how far away are you conversation, but instead, Paul's voice on the other end was frantic. Hey, are you Mike? Please don't cancel the ride, man. I've already had, like, ten drivers cancel on me. I really need this ride. It's an emergency. Mike frowned, his fingers tightening on the steering wheel. Relax, man. I'm not gonna cancel. Where do you need to go? There was a pause on the other end. It's... it's kind of far. We're just outside of Denver, but I need to get my family back to our place, a small farm up north. Mike hesitated for a moment, glancing at the clock. It was already late, and heading outside the city meant fewer chances of getting another ride back. But Paul's desperation was palpable, and the fare looked like it would more than make up for the hassle. Yeah, no problem, Mike said, feeling a little uneasy but pushing the thought aside. I'll be there in about 30 minutes. The drive to Bear Creek felt longer than it should have. The streets grew quieter as Mike left the city behind, the bright street lights giving way to the dim glow of his car's headlights cutting through the darkness. The trees grew denser, their branches casting long, spidery shadows across the road. Mike turned up the radio, trying to break the tension in the air. So, but even the familiar music couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As he approached the pickup location, his GPS directed him down a narrow, winding road. There were no houses, no lights, just the looming trees and the faint rustle of leaves in the breeze. Mike's stomach twisted with unease. Finally, he spotted the small clearing where Paul had said he'd be waiting. The scene that greeted him sent a chill down his spine. A small group of people stood in the faint glow of the car's headlights, 
An older man, a woman, a teenage boy, and a girl wrapped tightly in a blanket. They looked out of place, like they had stepped out of another time. The girl, in particular, drew his attention. Her face was pale, her eyes wide and glassy, staring off into the distance as if she was looking at something no one else could see. Paul, the older man, waved him over. He was thin, with hollow cheeks and deep-set eyes that suggested he hadn't slept in days. You're the only driver who showed up, Paul said as he approached the car, his voice heavy with gratitude. Thank you. I don't know what we would have done. Mike nodded, but his gaze kept shifting to the girl. Is she okay? He asked, motioning toward her. Paul's expression darkened. It's been a tough few months. She, she's not well. We're trying to get her help, but it's been hard. Mike didn't push further. He opened the door, and Paul, along with his wife and son, guided the girl into the back seat. Paul sat in the front, while the rest of the family squeezed in behind. As soon as they were settled, Mike pulled onto the road and began the long drive toward their farm. The tension in the car was thick, almost suffocating. Paul's wife, sitting behind Mike, kept whispering to her son, but the girl remained silent. Every now and then, Mike glanced at her in the rearview mirror. She was staring straight at him, her eyes unnervingly focused. Each time their gazes met, Mike's pulse quickened, but he couldn't look away. So, Mike said, trying to break the silence, you guys live out in the country? Paul nodded. Yeah, we've got a small place a few miles north. It's quiet, good for family. Sounds peaceful, Mike offered, though peace was the last thing he felt. As they drove, the landscape became increasingly desolate. The trees grew thicker, the roads narrower. The GPS struggled to keep up, and Mike felt a growing sense of isolation. It was as if they were driving into another world, far removed from the city they had just left behind. Suddenly, the girl began to mutter something under her breath. At first, it was barely audible, but it grew louder, a strange, guttural sound that sent shivers down Mike's spine. What's she saying? Mike asked, his voice tight with anxiety. Paul's face was grim. She... she does that sometimes. It's nothing to worry about. Just drive. But it was hard not to worry. The girl's muttering grew louder, her words unintelligible but filled with a strange, almost primal energy. Her brother looked out the window, his face pale, while their mother clutched his arm, whispering reassurances that Mike couldn't quite hear. The farther they drove, the worse the girl's behavior became. She started laughing, a deep, unsettling sound that echoed in the confined space of the car. Mike gripped the steering wheel tighter, his knuckles turning white. He didn't know how much more of this he could take. Then, without warning, the girl lunged forward, her hand cold as ice as it clamped down on Mike's shoulder. Stop the car, she demanded, her voice no longer her own. Mike slammed on the brakes, his heart racing. He pulled over to the side of the road, barely able to breathe. The girl threw open the door and bolted into the woods, her movements unnaturally fast. Paul and his son were out of the car in an instant, that chasing after her. The forest swallowed them up, leaving Mike alone in the car with the mother, who stared straight ahead, her face expressionless. Minutes passed, though it felt like hours, before Paul and his son returned, dragging the girl back to the car. She was quiet now, eerily calm, as if nothing had happened. They settled back into their seats and Paul told Mike to keep driving. Please. Paul said, his voice weary. Just get us home. The rest of the drive was a blur. Mike kept his eyes on the road, refusing to look in the rearview mirror. He could feel the girl's gaze on him, but he didn't dare meet it. His mind raced with questions, but he knew better than to ask. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, they arrived at a small, dilapidated farmhouse nestled deep in the woods. The place looked abandoned, the windows dark, the roof sagging under the weight of years of neglect. Mike hesitated, unsure if he should even step out of the car. Paul opened the door and stepped out, offering Mike a tired smile. Thank you for the ride, he said, 
handing Mike a wad of cash. I know it wasn't easy. Mike pocketed the money, eager to leave, but Paul stopped him. It's late. Why don't you stay the night? We've got a spare room. You shouldn't be driving through these woods alone at this hour. Every instinct in Mike's body screamed at him to decline, but the thought of driving back through the pitch black woods, with that girl's eyes still burned into his mind, made him hesitate. Sure, Mike said, forcing a smile. I'll stay. Paul led him into the farmhouse, showing him to a small room at the back of the house. It was simple. A bed, a nightstand, and a single window that looked out into the forest. The air was heavy, musty, and Mike felt a sense of unease settle over him. You can leave in the morning, Paul said, his voice distant. Sleep well. Mike lay down, but sleep didn't come easily. His mind raced, replaying the events of the night over and over again. Every creak of the old house made him jump and the wind howling outside sounded like distant whispers. Around 3 a.m., just as Mike was starting to drift off, he felt something cold touch his shoulder. His eyes snapped open and there, standing at the foot of his bed, was the girl. Her face was pale, her eyes hollow, and her lips twisted into a cruel smile. Get out, she whispered, her voice like ice. If you stay, you'll die. Mike's body froze. He couldn't move, couldn't speak. He was paralyzed, trapped in his own body as the girl leaned closer, her breath cold against his skin. Leave, she said again, her voice growing louder, more insistent. Leave now, or you'll never make it out of here. Somehow, Mike found the strength to move. He bolted from the bed, grabbing his keys and running for the door. He didn't look back as he sprinted to his car, his heart pounding in his chest. The drive back to the city was a blur. Mike barely registered the road. His mind consumed by the girl's words, by the terror that had gripped him so completely. Four days passed before Mike felt somewhat normal again, but the nightmares never left him. Even now, he sometimes wakes in the middle of the night, expecting to see the girl standing at the foot of his bed, whispering those same chilling words. The experience had changed him. He no longer worked night shifts no longer chased after the bigger fares. Some things, he had realized, weren't worth the money. And that, dear listeners, was Mike's story. If you have your own encounters with the supernatural, feel free to send them to us. Until next time, stay safe and trust your instincts. You never know what's waiting for you in the dark.